Welcome, friends, to Meet Me in Dreamland, a YouTube exploration of Coney Island's golden age, and this season, a deep dive into the Dreamland Amusement Park, one of the largest, most beautiful, and utterly surreal of the parks that dominated early 20th century Coney Island. In this episode, we'll be delving into Dreamland's birth and the somewhat shady politician who made it happen. Coney Island wasn't always a haven for amusement parks. Once, it was an island known as Neryok, the land without shadows by the local Lenape people, who fished from its sandy shores and gathered oysters and horseshoe crabs and in times of war would hide their families among the dunes as they waged battle on the mainland. In 1609, Henry Hudson anchored his ship, the Half Moon, in what is now Gravesend Bay, and sent his men to fish and hunt on the island, making them the first white people that we know of to see it. The Lenape weren't too happy with this intrusion into their safe haven, and they rose up against Hudson and his men, striking on a rainy day in September when Hudson's men were unable to light the tapers that they used to fire their muskets. Henry Hudson fled with two native hostages and sailed up the river to a series of other famous discoveries and eventually his mysterious disappearance. Soon, Dutch colonists arrived, traded and warred with the Lenape, but also brought disease and a strategy for undermining their entire economy through counterfeiting their currency, which was known as wampum. By 1639, the Dutch had destabilized the Lenape enough that they were able to do with Coney Island what they wished. And what they wished was, first of all, to call it Coney Island instead of Neriak, perhaps in reference to the numerous rabbits that teemed on the spit of land. And then the Dutch granted it to religious dissenters from England, who had already been run out of Puritan Salem. Their leader was, to quote the Puritan authorities, a dangerous woman named Lady Deborah Moody. The Dutch saw some value in shoring up the European influence in the area and granted her and her entourage a portion of Brooklyn and the island itself. She was the first European woman to found a colony in the New World. All of this is, of course, worth a deep dive video on its own, and maybe in the future I'll get to that. But suffice to say that Europeans replaced Europeans, the Dutch gave way to the English, the English gave way to the Americans, and through all that time, Coney Island was never really developed, serving instead as a place to graze animals, to fish, to gather oysters, to hide out or even bury treasure, but not really to live. Then, in the late 1800s, the population of American, by this time, New York, had reached a point where the wealthy desired a place to escape, and the criminal underworld of the city desired a place to make some money without interference from, you know, laws and cops and that kind of thing. Coney Island was close enough to the city to serve as an easy escape for both of these groups, and yet far enough to lay outside the influence of governmental bodies. Horse tracks, luxury hotels, gambling dens, and brothels soon sprouted from a veritable garden of sin. Within a few years, the island was gradually being tamed, and circus acts and sideshows rose in popularity, competing with the brothels and gambling dens. And then, at the turn of the 20th century, a whole new concept in entertainment rose up. The amusement park. Starting with Sea Lion Park and continuing with Steeplechase and Luna Park, the idea of a walled-off area for families to enjoy themselves without the kiddies having to deal with come-ons from the brothels or daddy sneaking off to play a few hands of poker, grew in appeal. A quick rundown. Sea Lion had the loop-de-loop. Steeplechase had the uh, steeplechase. And this weird-looking guy behind me. 
Luna had the shoot the shoots. And these places did great. So great that by 1903, after Luna Park had been opened only a few months, former New York Senator William H. Reynolds started looking into it as another money-making opportunity. Reynolds was a Brooklyn native who grew up in an extremely frugal household, so frugal that his father, who made his living as a builder, would repeatedly move his family into various unfinished and unheated houses in order to save a buck. Maybe as a reaction against this upbringing, young William Reynolds went the opposite direction and did everything, including spend money to excess. Fortunately for him, he also seems to have had a bit of a, a lucky streak to go along with his love of risk-taking, and soon after dropping out of law school at NYU, took over the family business and construction and made a fortune through real estate. A Republican, in 1893, he successfully plied his wealth into a campaign for the New York State Senate, where his most notable action was to vote against Brooklyn becoming a part of New York City. Obviously, that didn't work out, and neither did his political career, and he was voted out of office in the next election. But William H. Reynolds was not a man to simply recede into the background, and he was a natural-born gambler and a lover of various entertainments. He went back to his real estate business and started hitting the casinos and racetracks again, which led him to frequent Coney Island's various dens of iniquity, and he saw the money that Steeplechase and Luna were pulling in even in their first years of operation. He began plotting, and he formed a syndicate to sneakily buy up land just off the Coney Island seashore and even use his political connections to steal a chunk of public street and demolish all the structures on it. He clearly admired Luna Park's fanciful architecture and decided to um, use it as inspiration, by which I mean to rip it off and then also to try to one-up it at every turn. Welcome to Luna Park. We have a 200-foot tall tower decorated with one quarter of a million light bulbs. Well, Dreamland is going to have a 375 foot tall tower with a million light bulbs. Fine, um, here at Luna Park, we have the Shoot the Shoots ride. At Dreamland, we have Shoot the Shoots too, but with two ramps instead of one, and our lagoon is bigger. Luna has a firefighting attraction with, with real fire. Ours is bigger and our fire is hotter. Y you know what? F*** you. F*** you more. Finally, on May the 14th, 1904, after a year of construction and $3.5 million, and that's in 1904 money, which is about $116 million today, it was opening day, and what an opening. Luna and Dreamland both started their season on the same day, and the combined excitement drew 250,000 visitors to the island, more than ever before. On May 15, 1904, the day after opening, the New York Times printed this article. New Coney Island dazzles its record multitude. Luna Park and Dreamland, the centers of Great Crush. They took the lid off Coney Island last night, and a quarter of a million men and women got a glimpse of a swaying, rocking, glittering magic city by the sea. It was Coney Island's opening day, but Coney Island never before experienced such a bewildering opening. First of all, there were more people there than ever had been at Coney Island at one time before, and there were more dazzling, wriggling, spectacular amusements offered than had ever before been collected together at any one place in time. Dreamland, the site of which extends from Henry's Bathing Pavilion to the Iron Steamboat Company's Pier, takes in the old pier and reaches from Surf Avenue far into the ocean. Dreamland opened its gates for the first time yesterday, and scarcely at any time were there less than 20,000 persons visiting its wonderful features. 
illuminated at night and resembled a city in itself, but the visitor who went there yesterday found that after getting in, it contained many miniature cities. It proved to be a veritable fairyland with its mystic palaces and Aladdin-like shows. In addition to that, there was a circus in three rings, high divers, jugglers, aerial performances, and other things that are difficult to describe. Probably one of its most interesting features is the Dwarf City, with its thousand tiny inhabitants, storekeepers, policemen, firemen, musicians, wagon drivers, and others who live there are all dwarfs. They have a Lilliputian fire department with little fire engines, a miniature livery stable, a midget theater, midget circus, diminutive horses, bantam chickens, and everything else that would go to make a midget city, even to the midget Chinese laundrymen. Racism was a thing. It still is. The incubator building in Dreamland is designed in a farmhouse style, the first story being of brick and the upper part in half-timber. The tiled roof has a gable with a large stork overlooking a nest of cherubs. It is a scientific demonstration of how the lives of babies can be saved. It cost $36,000 and the building is full of babies. The Dog and Monkey Building contains Wormwood's Dog and Monkey Show. The front of the structure symbolizes its purpose and is decorated with coconut trees in which monkeys spring from branch to branch. The attraction called The Destruction of Pompeii is lodged in the Pompeian Building. Mr. Reynolds and a number of prominent New Yorkers were present last night when it formally opened with the Fire Show. Four thousand persons were employed in producing this spectacle. Upon the ringing of the fire alarm, firemen leaped from their beds in real engine houses and slid down brass poles as they do in the New York department. Their machines and horses were hitched in the regular way, and then they attended a real fire, which was certainly startling. A hotel appeared to burn, with scores of guests apparently trying to escape, and altogether this show proved a great success. Man, they loved their breathless reporting back in 1904. And so Dreamland was born. Next time, we'll delve into the wonders of the Lilliputian city populated by 1,000 little people from all over the world, including General Tom Thumb's wife. And hey, if you like this kind of video or um, content, as the kids say, you can support me by... Uh, hold on. Smashing that like button and pulverizing that subscribe button. And if you want, there's also a Patreon link in the description below. I'm just a tiny little creator. There's no sign of monetization or sponsorship anytime soon. So I'd really appreciate any financial support you can give if this is your kind of thing. And thank you.